guys. We're, uh, you got it. We're live. Okay. Baruch HaTorah, Dinari, Leinam, Edachilam, Shahakol, Nebid, Borei. Oh, Lachaim, everybody. Amen. Lachaim. We shall uh, we shall get drunk on the on 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 Maim Chaim, on the uh, water of life. And you know what the water of life is? Torah. Torah is likened to water because water at the top of the mountain, when it comes down to the bottom of the mountain, it's the same water. I mean, sometimes they can pick up some, you know, some twigs on the way and some other things, but basically it's the same water. So the same Torah that's on high, God's will and, and, and wisdom comes down here into this world that we can uh, engage in, that we can understand, that we can incorporate and make a part of our lives. So it's like water. It's, it is water. It's the water of life that gives life. As we know, as we study all this together, and uh, we know how the teachings bring us life. So we welcome everybody. Uh, Celia, welcome. And Liba, Abba, whoever can put on their uh, camera. Wow, that would be amazing. Diane and Art, Davida, Andrew, Goy, Michael, uh, Eliana. Heather is in uh, Ahuva. No, Michael he never sleeps. <laughs> and Tim. All right, folks. A good tavach, good week. So, uh, again, our learning because of the difficult circumstances and situations going on in Ukraine. Ultimately, Torah is the Torah of peace and it brings peace. As a matter of fact, that's some of the ideas that we're going to speak about today. What does it mean, peace? And to celebrate it. So we're going into the new book, Leviticus, Vayikra. And God calls to Moshe, come. Come and bring an offerings, various offerings, sacrifices in the Mishkan. And of course, later on in the Holy Temple, with a lot of details that are required. And for those who are uh, privileged to join on a daily basis, or even if it's on a daily basis, whenever you come to learn Rambam. So we learn about the many details of bringing offerings in the, in the Holy Temple. Now, to bring the offering, and it should, if it's an oil offering, so it's completely consumed on the altar. If it's a peace offering, so then some of it is consumed, some is eaten by the Kohanim and others are eaten, parts of it are eaten by the people that bring it, creating peace. So it, requ it requires a lot of fuel. And, uh, you know, the battle you could say today might have been perhaps, perhaps, and I don't want to get off on a political issue over here, but it might have... Uh, lost its oomph if um, Europe wasn't so dependent on one country for their fuel. But became, they became so dependent. What happened? They figured, oh, we've got them in our back pocket because they need us. So we don't have to worry about them, right? In any case, uh, I'm not making a political statement about that. I'm just bringing out the idea. Fuel is so important, right? So what was required, the fuel for the offerings? Firewood it was wood, a little flame that you needed to ignite it, but it was firewood. Now, the way we think about fuel in our car and the tank, or if it's heating our home, or if it's cooking our dinner, we just see it as a mere technicality. It's a practical requirement that's necessary 
to to run things in life. But actually, in the Holy Temple, the firewood was actually an integral part of the service. As we see in the parsha, let's share the screen. Okay, there we are. Such a warm day over here. My gosh. 50 degrees. I don't remember what that means. Almost 70 in New Jersey. <laughs> oh, that's that's like a heat wave. <laughs> so the, the bus success in this week's parsha. And the descendants of Aaron the Kaihen shall place fire on the altar and arrange wood on the fire. Okay, fair enough. Oh, it might seem like a technicality, but the Rambam, he describes on how this is needs to be done in a fixed daily schedule with uh, precise detail. The Rambam says, this is the schedule of the service Uh, for the fixed daily offerings. Shortly before dawn, the supervisor knocks on the gates of the temple courtyard, and they are open for him. Then the person chosen for the role arranges the large pile of wood on the altar, followed by the second pile, and then he brings up two additional logs of wood and places them on the large pile to increase uh, the fire. So, um, done everything in a, in a precise manner. There has to be an order to things, and this is just part of the details, is even more. There was even a storage room inside the uh, temple compound. In this chamber, the Kohanim would painstakingly inspect the wood to make sure that it didn't have any worms, because if it had any worms in it, it wasn't suitable to be on the holy art on, uh, altar as part of the sacrificial service. As the Mishnah says, the courtyard had four unroofed chambers of uh, four in its four corners. Each of them was 40 cubits squared. The chamber in the south northeastern corner was the wood chamber. Priests were, who were unable to partake in the temple work itself would work in this chamber inspecting the wood for worms. Any piece that had worms was unfit to use for the altar. Okay. Now it goes even further. Sourcing the wood was also a very important and actually a highly regulated process. Part of it in, actually included, and it was indeed donating wood by distinguished privileged families. There were only nine Jewish families that had the their right, the rights to this privilege, as the Mishnah continues and tells us. The wood festival of the priests, the Kohanim, and the people was celebrated nine times a year. On the first of the month of Nisan, the family are uh, Arach. From the tribe of Judah donated wood on the 20th of Tammuz. It was in the turn of the family of David from the tribe of Yehuda, of Yehuda. On the 5th of Av, the family of Abarash from the tribe of Yehuda donated the wood. On the 7th of the same month, it was the family of Ionadav, the son of Rechav. On the 10th of the month, it was the family of Sena from the tribe of Binyamin. On the 15th of the month, it was the family of Zatu from the tribe of Yehuda. And on the 20th of the month, it was the descendants of the a uh, Pachad Moa from the land of Yuda, and the 20th of Elo, the descendants of Adim from the tribe of Yuda, and the first of David's descendants of the Paros to return to bring the wood for a second time. Now, why these nine families? What was so special about them? Why did they get exclusive rights? So the Talmud gives us some historical background on this. The rabbis saw it in a brice. Uh, why was it necessary for the mission to specify the times of the wood festivals for the, for the Kohanim and the people? The sages explain that when the people returned to Babylon, uh, from the Babylon exile, actually, right, from the story of Purim that uh, is upon us, to the land of Israel, 
they could not find any wood in the temple wood chamber. These families specified in the Mishnah are the ones that came forward and volunteered to contribute from their own wood for this cause. In appreciation for this, the prophets in the era stipulated that even when the wood chambers is full of wood, these families will retain the privilege of contributing their own wood. As the verse states, we, the Kohanim, Levites, and the people, cast lots for the wood offerings to be brought to the home of our God, according to our families at appointed times every year to be turned, to be burned rather, upon the altar of our God, as is written in Torah in Nehemiah. So these are the families. They have the, the, the specific rights. Why? Because they came forward in a time of need when others didn't come forward. So because of their um, sacrifice, because of their commitment, so they get the privilege to be able to um, give the donation towards the general upkeep of the, you know, the, the, the firewood for the Holy Temple. Now, that being said, you can make your own personal donation for your own offering, right? As it says in the Midrash, from where do we derive that individuals were able to donate wood? The first states, when a person brings a sacrifice, we derive from here that the individual may also donate wood. So your individual uh, offering, you could bring even the wood, the, fu the, the fire, the fuel that would go together with the animal that would be offered. So I know if you took note in the, uh, in the previous reading, but uh, we had mentioned the wood festival. No, no, not Woodstock festival the wood festival. Woodstock would have had their priorities right. They would have made the wood festival. Right, what, what, what is the reference of the, uh, that donation wood that was a festive joyous occasion? It was a festive joyous occasion. So the Rambam tells us the following. What was the day of the wood sacrifice? Certain families had a fixed time on which they would go out in the forest and bring wood to pile on the altar. On the day designated for each particular family to bring their wood sacrifice, their donation, right? They would bring voluntary burnt animal sacrifices. So they would bring voluntary um, offerings. This occasion was called the day of the wood sacrifice and it was celebrated as a festival for the family bringing the wood. On this day, the family was forbidden to deliver mournful eulogies for the deceased or fast, and they were not also not allowed to perform work on this day. This was the custom. Wow. So this is a family festival of the wood offering that they brought on that particular day. They abstained from work. Right. They couldn't say it's like a, a day without tachanun, right? Without the supplicational prayers, which uh, means also then you don't make eulogies, you don't fast on that day because it's a celebrative day. Likewise, if an individual brought their own wood, they would also celebrate the day um, as a personal, you know, holiday, shall we say, as Rambam says in Mishnah Torah. Even a private individual donated wood or logs for a pile on the altar is forbidden to deliver mournful eulogies for the deceased or to fast and is also not allowed to perform work on this day. This was the custom. So it was a celebrative time. That's what it was. Again, just to make clear, the celebration was a on a personal level or a family celebration, right? It was a personal celebration, family celebration, excuse me. Um, and a very joyous time. So, of course, we need to understand what is this all about? What does this mean exactly? What is this celebration about? Um, 
but let's move forward. Now, in honor of uh, today's class, that it's such beautiful weather here in New Jersey, even nicer. I would imagine uh, further south is even nicer weather, right? Reminding us of the of the summer. So, um, and in the summer, we celebrate what's called Tubov, the 15th of Av. Um, Talmud gives us a description about that particular day. It's a, a holiday. And Talmud tells us, what happened on that day, maybe you're familiar, I'm sure you've heard this in the past, Jewish girls would go, uh, go out and dance in the vineyards and single men would come to find a wife. The uh, Ta'anit scholar taught, one who did not have a wife would turn to there to find one. The sages taught about the details of the practice. The beautiful girls would say, young man, pay attention to beauty because a wife is primarily for her beauty. The girls of a distinguished lineage would say, pay attention to the family because a wife is primarily for children. The simple girls that lack beauty and distinguished lineage would say, make your choice based on holy considerations out of the fear of heaven and after you, uh, and after marriage, you will adorn us with gold jewelry. <laughs> right? Um, now, this is one of the things that happened on Tuba. Of. This is one of seven things that occurred on that day. But the greatest thing that occurred on that day, um, and we're not going to go into the whole Talmudic discussion about that, is that on the 15th of, of our families that we're talking about and individuals who would make a wood donation, it actually ended then. It was the final donation. It was the final day of giving, right? Now, hard to believe that, you know, Jews would say, yeah, can't donate after here. <laughs> well, would you can't? Maybe other things you could, <laughs> right? But uh, yeah, that was the end of the donation. The Talmud explains the donations schedule, what it has to do with the 15th of Av. So the Talmud tells us the 15th of the month of Av was a day which they ceased cutting trees for the wood in the old, on the altar. Rabbi Eliezer, the great taught, following the 15th of all, the sun's strength wanes. So they would stop cutting trees for the altar because the wood wouldn't be sufficiently dry, providing an inviting habitat for worm infestation. Rabbi Menashe said, they therefore called this the day of the breaking of the axes. This is the day of breaking of the axes. Wow. Um, as they would no longer um, necessary for the season. So this becomes a national holiday for the Jewish people, right? All people, unlike what we learned earlier, that it was celebrated only by individuals or by families, right? A private uh, celebration. This was a national one. Why is this different? What did this have to do with the people at large? I mean, think about it. You know, it was only those families that brought the wood or individuals that brought the wood. So at that point, they had to stop. Mm -hmm. So why would that be national, first of all? Secondly is, what was the cause of the halt of the, uh, of the wood donation? It doesn't seem to have any religious significance. It just happens to be something seasonal, right? Now the sun is waning. So when you cut wood, cut down wood, it will remain damp from this point on, right? The 15th of all onwards. It, excuse me, it may remain damp. And because it'll be damp, it'll be an invitation for worm infestation, which doesn't make it suitable for the altar. So it just means, you know, the season's over. All right. It's like, you know, you lost, uh, you lost in the playoffs, season's over, you pack your bags, you know, and you go home. What are you celebrating over here? What's the great joy? Are you making a celebration of this? The day of breaking of the axes. 
It's called a celebrative holiday. Why this great joy? So here we're introduced into a novel idea that when a Jew concludes a mitzvah, it's a cause for great joy. You conclude it, a mitzvah, it's a cause for great joy. As Rabbi Yosef Ibn Chavivi, Chaviva, Tells us 15th of Av was celebrated as a joyous festival because on this day they would complete and conclude the mitzvah of the wood donation. It's customary to make a festive day with a celebratory meal when one completes any mitzvah. So this is on a national scale, this celebration, simply because it marked the time that we reached the completion of this particular mitzvah. So as we will see now a halachic ruling that it goes actually far beyond the single wood celebration in temple times. As the Amshir Shloyme, Rav Shloyme Luria tells us, when a Jew completes the study of a section of Torah, they should give praise and thanks to God and publicize their celebration, their celebration of completion as can be derived from the Talmud where it states that the Jewish people had no greater festivals than Yom Kippur in the 15th of Av, the Talmud gives various reasons for the festive nature of this day, the 15th of Av, until it concludes that with the reason that this was the final day of the cutting wood for the altar. In other words, since they completed a great mitzvah on that day, they would celebrate it as a festival. As he continues and says, there can be no greater mitzvah than that, completion of a section of the Torah. This is especially true when one's intention is to immediately begin to study of another section of the Torah. Even other people who do not complete this section themselves share in the great mitzvah to join in the celebration of the person who has completed the study. So this day is a special day, the 15th of Av, a uh, joyous occasion. But it seems like a little disproportionate. There's some people that bring the offerings. Not everybody brings it. You can bring it individually for your, for your offering. It can, it's by, brought by nine other families. But why making such a big deal that becomes something of a national holiday? And especially, it's a relatively obscure practice of chopping wood that merely serves as a prerequisite fulfilling the, uh, to fulfill the mitzvah of bringing the offering. Remember, this is the fuel for the offering. It, it's, it, it's not an outright mitzvah in and of itself. It supports the mitzvah. So I make such a big to-do that only some people are involved in it. And it's only a supportive role. Okay, I know what you're going to say. You get an Oscar for a supporting role. <laughs> yeah, but we're talking about it's everybody's celebration. It's not just the winner of the, uh, you know, the one who, who, who wins the Oscar. That's their celebration. Everybody else is celebrating. How do we understand that? So the answer to this lies in something that maybe we didn't pick up so clearly. Well, we just kind of went over it in uh, text number seven. When we called it an axe-breaking day. Not a back-breaking day, an axe-breaking day. Puzzling detail. What do you mean, axe-breaking day? Like they broke, their, they broke the axes. What was the purpose of destroying the axes? Hmm. Maybe if you destroy that, you, you destroy the axis of evil. Maybe that's the answer. Uh, <laughs> destroy the axis. You'll destroy the axis of evil. Ah. Okay, that sounds like a cute story that I just made up. <laughs> but on a simple level, it seems apparently to be a wasteful activity that you the axes that you use to cut down the trees 
Now, what are you going to do at the end of the season? You're going to break the axes. And now you're going to, and that is the celebration of the completion of this mitzvah. Whoa, what's going on here? Um, pretty, uh, pretty heavenly idea over here. Or, or, or maybe the opposite. Are we clear? Yeah, any questions, comments before we on 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 topic, not off topic? Okay, beautiful. Oh, Michael, you asked about the eulogies if there was a death, so there would be eulogies, yeah. Like if someone is being buried on Rosh Chodesh, you don't see Tachanu and you're not allowed to make a eulogy. Right, the idea of a eulogy, especially back in the day when you know when we learned this in Rambam, it was like meant to arouse the heart of the people that are here in order that, that they bring them to tshuva and it would be like a very heart rendering thing. So you can speak in a way that's not heart rendering, but well, not a, a, a regular kind of eulogy, right? Um, so, so there would be eulogies. That's I didn't. So not, not not in what the 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 um the the traditional not 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 today's eulogies that people yeah. make jokes maybe you know or something like that you know uh what, what it was a, a, you know back in the day they would have town criers coming to cry so that way it would kind of uh, uh arouse people to to chuva right and so that kind of stuff no can't do that not not if it's rosh chodesh not if it's a day without tachanun not allowed to do this. So if one passes, so you doesn't mean you don't bury them, and it doesn't mean you can't make eulogies later. And not that. So the same thing here on Tubal. You can't do that because of the uniqueness of this day. So again, you know, that's what we're trying to wrap our heads around over here, right? What what's like so such a national holiday over here? And yeah, and yeah, and not just nationally, even individually. Um uh, so okay, we got a, a, a we have a an explanation that you finish a mitzvah, so it's something to celebrate. We got that, but you know, what did the Mishnah tell us? There weren't holidays for the Jewish people like Yom Kippur and and, and Tuba. You know, like they were so like you know Yom Kippur celebrative. You know, God gives us atonement. What's this about Tuba that is so un unbelievable? Okay, so everything, of course, can only be appreciated and understood in context. When we don't have context, then we don't have an understanding of things because then we are just myopic and we just see the thing itself, but we don't see it as part of a greater picture. Now, of course, sometimes you need to see things just individually for itself. But at the same time, we need to be able to see it in the larger picture and have the context for this. So the 15th of Av comes after six days after the 9th of Av, Tisha Av. Right? These two events are in close proximity in the Jewish calendar, which gives us an indication about something about Tuba Av and, and its greatness. In a sense, Tuba Av becomes the symbol of the antidote or the healing for the mournfulness of Tisha B'Av, the ninth of Av. And the Rebbe looks at this from this quirk in the calendar, right? It's divinely orchestrated, obviously. And it looks at the language of the Mishnah to uncover an obvious link between them. It's The teaching that the Jewish people had no greater festivals than Yom Kippur and the 15th of Av appears immediately after the Mishnah's discussion of the 9th of Av, the greatest day of mourning of the year. It is a direct continuation from this that the Mishnah concludes on a positive note with the opposite extreme. The Jewish people had no greater festivals than Yom Kippur and the 15th of Av. 
So Tisha B'Av, the ninth of Av, right, which is the destruction of two holy temples, right? The Jews were expelled from England in 1290, 1492 in Spain, all on Tisha B'Av, you know, and many other calamities befell the Jewish people as a result. So the, the ninth of uh, magnifies the significance of the 15th as a result, right? This is why the 15th of Av is such a joyous time because it's the reverse, it's the opposite of the ninth of Av, right? So using this line of reasoning, the Rebbe now explains why the Talmud prefers the notion of wood chopping as the reason for the celebration on the 15th over other six things that are connected with the 15th of Av. Because the completing of the wood chopping is directly linked to the temple. The building whose destruction was the reason that we are mourning on the ninth of Av. As it explains, the proximity indicates that whatever there it is that's the cause for there being no greater festivals than Yom Kippur in the 15th of Av is connected to the fact that it is the reverse of things that happened on the ninth of Av. This is why the Talmud accepts the day of which they cease cutting trees for the wood on the altar as the main reason. For there are no greater festivals than Yom Kippur and 15th of over all the other reasons listed there in the Talmud for the celebration of the 15th of Av, right? This was an event that was related to the building of the temple, the exact opposite of its destruction. So again, what do we say? Ninth above is destruction, right? Destruction of the holy temple. What's the 15th above? The final day of chopping of the wood that you can bring into the holy temples. It's connected with bringing the offerings in the holy temple. Okay. But how does that become an antidote exactly? Like, what is the offering of the, of the wood become the antidote? the healing power for the destruction of the Holy Temple. What's the connection between them? Question clear? So it's important to understand that the sacrifices, the offerings, weren't just another, you know, what wasn't just a mere element of temple service in other words, the temple was an awe-inspiring building that had manifestation of holiness and the Holy of Holies with the Ark of the Covenant. And there was also a functional, you know, practical purpose of, uh, of fulfilling, you know, some of the uh, bringing offerings on the outer altar. No. The sacrifices is actually, as Maimonides or Rambam teaches us, the main function and purpose of the base and of the Holy Temple. Ram says the pots of is to build a house for God. And why? In which sacrifices will be offered. In other words, the core of the Holy Temple was the sacrifices that are offered to make that a home for God. The other things, the other elements, are secondary to this primary purpose. And that's key to understand the meaning of the breaking of the axis that happened on the 15th of Av. Axes are made from iron. That's a material that's banned from use for the construction of the altar, as the mission itself explains. The stones that formed the ramp leading up to the altar, as well as the stones of the altar itself, were all sourced from the valley of Beit Kerem. They dug into virgin soil and extracted whole stones on which no iron had been applied since iron disqualifies material for the altar by its very touch. The reason for this is that iron serves the purpose of shortening life, whereas the purpose of the altar is to extend people's lives. It is therefore inappropriate to use material that shortens life on a structure that extends life. Hmm, okay. 
So sacrifices on the temple, they bring us atonement. Atonement then, what, that, what does that do? Extends our lives. we become cleansed. When you're cleansed, that brings greater life. Iron is a material that ultimately, of course, can be used in any way we want to, but it's associated at least with death and destruction, which means shortening the lives of people. It's connected with, with war, with violence, a knife. You know, yes, a knife could be used to put butter on toast, but the, the symbol of the knife, of the dagger, of the metal, you know, war machine of destruction, shortening lives. So therefore, the God says in the Torah that it would be inappropriate for iron to be used for the construction of the altar. The two are incompatible. The axe is made from iron. Now, it, serves, it serves a useful and necessary purpose in preparing the wood for the altar, no doubt. But that's until it can serve that purpose for the altar. That altar in which iron may never touch. But as much as the axe is useful in, in a preparatory tool, it still remains a foreign material in context of the altar's function and work. So it's not a fit. So as the seasons change, the, the sun's brightness dims. The cutting of the wood for the altar comes to a close. The axes are discarded. They're broken. Now they served a wonderful purpose till now. They were a great utility. But that utility has now been done with. And then it only remains then as a destructive tool. So you don't want it to remain as a destructive tool. What do you do? You destroy it. Breaking of the axis, as it's called. That serves to highlight the quality and the function of the altar, which is the centerpiece, as we mentioned, as Rambam says, of the temple service, which is to extend life by bringing your offerings to bring atonement. So discarding the iron symbolizes turning over to a new, you know, Un, no, uh, no destruction towards life in a positive, constructive manner. So the day of the 15th of Av and the destruction of the axes therefore encapsulate the entire vision of the Holy Temple, which is a place to bring life and positivity. And therefore that itself causes joy because it becomes the ultimate antidote to the destruction of the ninth of Av. So that explains. The special events of the 15th of Av on which the day, the ceasing cutting of the trees and the wood on the altar, speaks to the very purpose of the building of the altar, the altar and the sacrifices. The purpose of the altar as a place intended to extend people's lives by bringing sacrifices in which it was expressed by the event of the conclusion of the wood chopping. The act of breaking the axis that was done on the 15th of Av was the breaking of the counterweight to the altar. Excuse me, the iron that shortens lives. This is why the iron axes were broken in a literal sense. From that point on, they were no longer served as a useful purpose of cutting the wood for the altar. And all that remained was their destructive nature that shortens people's lives. It is therefore proper to break them. So think about it for a moment. 
A powerful message over here. We're talking about a national holiday that's made. And what is it saying? You've, you've finished this mitzvah, which this mitzvah is only a preparation because it's, it's not a mitzvah in and of itself, right? Tefillin is a mitzvah in and of itself. If you put on tefillin without praying, you did a mitzvah, you made a bracha, you put on tefillin, you didn't say anything. Mitzvah, putting on tefillin. If you said shema without tefillin, you did a mitzvah. Mitzvah shema. Wood itself, it's not an offering. It's only the fuel. Cutting of the wood is not even the wood itself. It's only the cutting of the wood. It's only chopping it. It's, only, it's a preparation of a preparation. But yet it all goes towards this mitzvah. And now you celebrate. So you're celebrating the fact that, first of all, you finished the job. And what did you finish? Only that which is a preparation, you know, to for the offerings that can actually bring atonement, because the wood itself doesn't bring atonement. The offerings bring the atonement. But yet, it's something to celebrate that in itself. But that's not enough. It's also you're celebrating that the things that are a means to an end, they have an end. You break the axes, especially the means to an end that is possibly a destructive end. The axes made of iron, iron sharp, shortens lives. It doesn't extend lives. So you, you celebrate the awareness that I, I've done what I need to do with this. That is a means to an end. That's done with. Celebrate that and celebrate the fact that now we can, we've done everything that's a preparation for that which is going to be an end in itself, the offering itself. This is a very powerful idea um, when, when you think about it. Because we are, you know, we celebrate Simchas Torah. Well, there's a mitzvah to learn Torah. There's a mitzvah to, to you know, go through the entire Torah readings over the year. And now you came to a conclusion and of course, with the resolve that you're going to continue reading it after Simchas Torah further, I mean, we even do it on Simchas Torah, we begin, begin the beginning of Bereshis once again. And, and that makes sense, you've got to celebrate. I mean, that's Torah. Of course, you're going to celebrate Torah, right? No question about that. We are, uh, several of you, come learn Rambam every day. In a, in a, I don't know, two and a half months or something like that, we're going to finish the entire Rambam. It's going to be a great celebration. Right? Of course, that's a positive thing. So all positive mitzvahs that we come to a conclusion, learning any area of Torah, like when we learn Tanya, we finish certain parts, you know, it, it's, it is something to, to celebrate, whatever it might be. But the uniqueness over here is like the, and the oddity of it is that it, you know, Simchas Torah, positive thing. Finishing Mishnah Torah, or if you finish the, uh, uh, you know, tractate of the Talmud, or you finish, you know, in the, the Mishnah, whatever it is, those are positive things of Torah learning that we need to celebrate. But here, the celebration is even not a, a, a direct mitzvah, it's an indirect mitzvah that leads to atonement of the full mitzvah of bringing an offering on the altar. And what are you celebrating? Yes, the finishing of it, but it's also the, the finishing of it, recognizing that this preparation, even though in a sense what they did is not just a means to an end, it is on one hand a means to an end. 
right? Because it is only part of the greater mitzvah, bringing the sacrifice. But it's not just an incidental. That that's the beautiful thing over here: the fuel in our car and the that that which warms our home, and uh, you know, fuel that makes our dinner. Um, that is a incidental that we give. We don't give thought to it. And it's not really important. Here comes the Torah tells you that even that which is only a means to some end, in a certain way, needs to be celebrated in and of itself. Because without it, you don't have the end. So there needs to, that needs to be recognized. And, and even that, which is a means to an end, and this is the beauty over here, is it really rings the message of a means to an end. Because what you do at the end, you break the axis. Oh, why? Because, well, it's, it's iron. Iron is, can only be a means to an end. Chopping down some wood to make firewood for the altar. And once that's done, you know, it's got no value sitting around because it, it's a destructive force in and of itself. Right? So the so break that, get rid of it. And in that we celebrate because in the destruction of it, what is it telling me? It's telling me because there's something greater and that is the positive action that we take in, the, in, in bringing an offering on the altar. That there's something more that becomes the ultimate end in and of itself. Beautiful idea. Any questions, any comments, any thoughts? Okay. So again, I just want to make sure that we emphasize the idea here of, you know, let's make it more personal. And maybe ties in, in a way, what we learned in the JLI class this past week. I'm just thinking, kind of ties in with it, about what it means work. It means eating and drinking, uh, food that are primarily a means to an end. And so here, you know, okay, here, it, it, so it can, it can be something celebrative about that too when you come to a conclusion of something. But it's a, it's a, you're celebrating it in the sense of um, recognizing that there's the, the means to the end that leads you to the end itself. So that means when you can recognize that and you break the axis, so then that gives you a celebration in the means because it's going to lead her to a greater end. So, you know, you got a promotion at work. You got, uh, you know, you came to an end of, uh, you know, the accounting season <laughs> finished, right? You did all the, uh, the books for everybody, whatever, right? And so you celebrate, you take out a l'chaim, and you say, l'chaim, thank Hashem for whatever, but, and then what is, and a recognition that this is only a means to an end. And now, you know, let me celebrate this because I know that there's something more than just this means to an end. Right? Usually when we'll celebrate, you know, the, the success in something, it's for the success itself that we're celebrating, right? Feeling of an achievement, the feeling of, you know, uh, uh, a feeling, you know, um, you know, more honorable, more uh, worthwhile and so on. Um, that's kind of the feeling that you would have. And, um, and it's, it's not about to lead you to anything greater. You know, just celebrating, enjoying the moment. No, no, no. 
it, it was the celebration wasn't in a, it, you were enjoying the moment that's leading you to a greater place. That's why you break the axis because you realize, okay, this has no function anymore. And the now where that's leading me is uh, carry on with the mitzvah that's an end in itself, the offerings themselves. So it's a celebration. And at the same time, recognizing that the celebration leads to me to more. And the truth is in everything we do is that way, like Simcha's Torah, right? We, we're celebrating finishing the conclusion of the Torah. And what do we do? Start We start reading again on the very same day. Now we don't wait till next Shabbos. We don't wait till next week. We start already on Simcha's Torah, reading from the beginning again. Whoa, that's pretty... Why? Because... Everything, even though we're celebrating, it, the celebration isn't just, you know, the celebration is to um, just to enjoy the moment for yourself, right? So then, you know, you want to just savor the moment. But here it's a celebration that is much greater than that, much more than that. It's not to savor the moment because the moment will pass anyways. So um that this moment can lead me to a greater place ah then that's something to celebrate Hi. any questions any comments any thoughts You know, deep in meditation. Thank you, Liba. All right. I'll leave you deeply meditative. <laughs> All right, folks. That's why we never stop. You know, Tomorrow, Tanya in the morning, Rambam in the afternoon, and you know, goes on and goes on because um, it's not a, a it's not not about achieving a plateau or two plateau, but it's you know, constant engagement and constant growth, which is beautiful. I thank you for that. I I, I thank you that you're here for us all the time. God bless you and God bless everybody. I remind, oh, I, I, just to let you know, I, I, I've mentioned a couple of times on the Tanya that um, I'm going to create a new forum yes. for um, the Tanya Rabbi community, TRC, Learning to Live, <laughs> um, which will uh, feature a different, you know, things that uh, will be offered to uh, to those who want to be a part of it. Um, more more to come soon. And, uh, Are you still going to do the class in June? We'll still, yeah, no, I'll still have the, the regular stuff, but this is uh, more. Good. Listen, what did we just learn, right? You celebrate means just go bring it to the next level, <laughs> right? Mm -hmm. So we, uh, we're gonna, yeah, we'll have for sure. Yeah, well, but um, we need to bring it to the next level. Keep you posted. Thank you. You're amazing. You are. God bless you. Thank you. God, God bless you all and thank you. And um, yeah. Quick question. Sure. These um, slides that you use for the parasha, are they the same ones? Because I vaguely recall that we that we learned about the axes, but I don't know if it was the exact same lesson or not. No, this is a new lesson because this is a new sicha that um, I, I hadn't learned before. We did learn about tuba of before, and we did learn about, but we didn't explain this aspect of it. 
as, as far as I remember, unless I, you know, maybe you remember better than I do. No, no, no. There's so much. It's, it's, um, it's but almost we, like I'm at a point where it's like, oh, I'm getting confused. <laughs> uh, no. So, yes, we did learn about Tuba of, and we learned it from a different aspect, um, but um, not, um, not this message. To my knowledge, at least, because to me it was new. Davida, thank you, Aruba. Unless you have something else. Davida. I don't hear you too well. Is it not working? I speak, sir. You can't unmute, it looks like. All right, next time. Oh, oh wait, I got it. Oh, oh you got it. Uh, Mazel <laughs> Uh, Rabbi Fun, I, I just want to say that was great as always, and it's always inspiring. And um, I just want to ask one quick question. It, I noticed in Judaism, there's so many cycles. I, there's constantly things growing and growing and keep growing and all different cycles and um, like the Shemitah year, the... Um, there's so many. I mean, is there importance to each one that we should like pay attention to? Or is it like, as you're saying, like the means to an end? So, I mean, there's, there's, you know, look, just on, on a very simple level, we have a yearly cycle, we have a monthly cycle, we have a weekly cycle, a daily cycle, hourly cycle right so you're right there's so many that's just in time the cycles right? mm -hmm. cycle of life and the different celebrations of life right you have different points in time so um uh absolutely that all of them have a significance and play out in different ways um you know I'm not exactly clear on the question to know how to answer what you were, what you were looking for, but you know the awareness of all of this, of course, uh, leads us to um, to connect better to whatever is happening, whatever the engagement is in the moment, right? Um, so and that that's all. You know, what more can I say? is uh, hey, hey. You know, the awareness that, you know, I, I'm not exactly sure where to take that with, but, uh, but you know, the, the, we have greater awareness and, you know, all of this really stems ultimately is how Hashem animates the world in, in, in different manners that lead to different cycles um, and different things that are happening, uh, you know, all at the same time, different time and whatnot. I hope that helps. Yes, thank you, Rabbi Fine. Because I, I was just wondering why so many cycles in so many different areas. So that way you're going to go this way, and then you're going to turn <laughs> around that way, and you're going to go this way and that way. You know, it's just to keep you, uh, you know, out of trouble. Uh, <laughs> Every corner. <laughs> uh, yeah, but you could go from one point from A to B instead of making a circle. I mean, there's different ways to get to different points. Right. If you want to get lost, there's a way to get lost. If there's a way to stay on, on stay on that path, there's a cycle for it. Yeah. But you you have in Judaism, there's so many different cycles. Why the reason for all the cycles? Because you have cycles for the Jubilee year. You have cycles for Torah study. You have cycles for um, the uh, woman's um, 
Mida, and you has, I mean, all these things in different areas. So all of it reflects a different reality of how Hashem is animating the world, right? Mm -hmm. Yearly, monthly, weekly, that's all, you know, all uh, being animated from, from Hashem in a different manner um, that therefore creates a different cycle. And each one of them has a reality in our lives that, you know, when we're aware of it, right? Uh, you know, are, you're aware that you are in a particular year, in a particular month, right? In a particular day of the week, right? All of that has significance. Actually, it's interesting, you know, so the Rebbe, uh, for the Rebbe was so real, this, these various cycles. So he would, at a fabring in, he would tie in the significance of the year with the particular month that we're in, the day of the week, and the study of that day had a connection. So the Rambam study, uh, you know, had a connection to that particular day. Um, the Tanya study had a particular, and Chumash had a particular connection. Each one is a different cycle. And each one um, is connected with the reality of that day. And the Rebbe would speak and connect them and show, you know, their, their, the, the, uh, the significance, excuse me, and the, and the consequence and the meaning behind those connections. So absolutely, absolutely true. All right, folks. A gute Nacht. A gute Good night. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you. Thank you. Did your wife kill you for the ring and the flower? <laughs> no, you're still here, so you're fine. Okay. <laughs> it, it, it wasn't a real, it was, uh, you know, like a, a ten dollar ring. <laughs> I, thought that, I thought that was so funny, though. <laughs> uh, yeah. Good night. God bless you. Be well. Good night. God bless you. Bye. Thanks.